right, uh, thanks a lot, and uh, also welcome from my side to this talk. Um, over the course of the next like 30, 35 minutes, I will run you through a crash course in error handling for streaming data pipelines. And then we'll have some time for questions. And before we get started, I'd like to get a feeling for the audience. So who of you is building streaming data pipelines? Nice. Uh, also operating them? Okay. Uh, using technologies like Apache Kafka. Cool. Using orchestration systems like Kubernetes? Okay, great. Then, um, yeah, <laughs> hopefully the, uh, this presentation will, will be helpful um, for building uh, even more robust streaming data pipelines. And uh, uh, getting a feeling for the uh, various kinds of errors that can occur and uh, also giving you some, some hints on uh, how to handle them and how to monitor streaming data pipelines. And in this talk, we, we will focus on error handling for those streaming data pipelines that are based on technologies like um, Apache Kafka, Kafka Connect, and Kafka Streams. And uh, we'll start with a short overview of potential errors that can occur, uh, both transient and non-transient errors. Uh, what they are, we'll talk about in a bit. Uh, we'll discuss strategies for handling them, for bo uh, handling both uh, transient and non-transient errors, and also discuss uh, different ways for monitoring the different components of a streaming data pipeline. Most concepts you can transfer to similar technologies, so we'll here have a look at Kafka Streams. As a stream processing technology, you can certainly um, adopt some of the concepts to similar technologies like Apache Flink. Who's using Flink here? Okay, unfortunately we'll not discuss Flink, but I think you can carry over some of the concepts. Great. Okay, and what's a streaming data pipeline? So a streaming data pipeline uh, consists of different components. Uh, in a nutshell, it replicates data from data sources like PostgreSQL, like a database system or an API, to data sinks, like maybe a Snowflake data warehouse or an API or another database system, and can process the data on the way um, using a stream processing technology like Kafka Streams or Flink, and then filter data transform data, join data, um, and aggregate data. And um, yeah, the different components uh, on that slide take care of different tasks. So um, a Kafka Connect-based source connector uh, extracts change events from a data source like Postgres, um, produces these change events to a Kafka topic, which is then consumed by a Kafka Streams application, which can potentially process the events and produces the, proce uh, the, the processed events to another Kafka topic, which is then consumed by a sync connector, uh, which takes care of sending these events to an external system like a data warehouse, an API, or whatever. Um, so far, so good? Cool. Um, directly after a lunch break, so I expect you to be a bit tired, but um, you're still following. <laughs> cool. Um, and when it comes to streaming data pipelines, error handling is certainly not a straightforward, easy task because you face certain challenges. So first, as you've seen on the previous slide, streaming data pipelines involve using different uh, distributed systems, which are uh, more or less uh, loosely coupled, but you need to become an expert in different um, distributed technologies, like Kafka Connect is a distributed technology, Apache Kafka is a distributed technology, I'm also running uh, technologies like Kafka Streams is certainly not straightforward, um, making also error handling um, a quite, I would say, complex um, task. Um, as opposed to batch data pipelines, which you run at, at fixed times and then you're done, these streaming data pipelines are continuously being executed, which um, yeah, also pose specific requirements uh, 
uh, in, yeah, with regard to, to error handling, because you also need to take care of, of error handling um, in an even more, let's say, automated way than uh, what you would need to do for batch data pipelines. We have different kinds of errors which you need to handle uh, using different ways. And, well, we're working with data, so there's always a business component um, uh, being, being involved. So uh, taking care of some of the errors uh, requires some business uh, knowledge, which, which is not always a given and it may harden uh, the, the task. Okay, what are potential errors in streaming data pipelines? Well, first we have transient errors. So uh, on the overview page, I already um, yeah, kind of discuss that transient and non-transient errors. These are like the two main categories that errors, potential errors can fit into. And transient errors are basically temporary recoverable errors that may go away, uh, let's say by themselves um, over time. So examples are network, fa network failures that can occur, hardware failures, maybe a broken disk or something, or also in some cases, certain software failures. And here we can um, yeah, more or less uh, think of, let's say, a problem that will uh, go away after some time. So you can certainly think of maybe dealing with it with them um, by kind of uh, turning off the machine and turning it on um, again. Concrete examples for network failure may be uh, Kafka Connect, um, speaking to an Apache Kafka cluster and Kafka Connect loses the connection to the Kafka cluster for uh, maybe uh, yeah, for the reason of a, a network partition. Um, and uh, then you'll have a um, failure here. Um, Kafka Connect is no longer operational, but once the network partition has been resolved, uh, once the network is operating uh, normally um, again, it will more or less um, resolve itself. Another example for a transient recoverable error are hardware failures. So again, let's think about Kafka Connect um, integrating with uh, Apache Kafka. And by the way, for those of you who don't know, Kafka Connect it basically uses um, Apache Kafka for persistent configurations, um, uh, the status of uh, connectors, and so on. And maybe an Apache Kafka broker becomes unavailable because um, a disk uh, fails. Uh, the disk needs to be replaced. The, the broker will uh, restart after some time. Um, and during that period, uh, you might also see some impact of that failure um, on your, in this case, uh, Kafka Connect cluster. Another example for a transient um, error are software failures. So let's think about maybe Kafka Streams application that you deploy in Kubernetes, where you define resource requests and res uh, resource limits, and uh, maybe you assign a resource limit of four uh, gigabyte um, for, for the main memory uh, to the Kafka Streams application. Maybe it leaks some memory over time, exceeds that limit, um, and then it gets, in the case of Kubernetes, uh, restarted by kubelet. But you will certainly have an impact um, on the uptime of your application. But restarting will solve the issue. Um, on the other side, when we go away from the transient errors that um, are more or less recoverable, automatically recoverable, we have the non-transient errors that you cannot easily automatically recover from. So these are like persistent errors. Um, for instance, uh, failures when it comes to deserializing or serializing data. Maybe you expect data to be in the JSON format, but you get Afro format and then run into troubles uh, with regards to deserializing uh, the data. Maybe violation of business rules um, or certain bugs in your applications. And let's have a look at an example. Let's assume we have a Kafka Connect source connector consuming files from a S3 bucket, um, expecting the data to be in the JSON format. And uh, well, in some cases, the files are in the, in the Afro format. Deserializing the data fails and then the connector is uh, unhealthy, is, is broken. 
and certainly restarting the connector will not automatically fix this issue, um, which is related to the format of the data. Okay, next example is the violation of business rules. So let's assume we have a streaming application, uh, just generally speaking, um, that um, expect certain fields of the records to have a value, but you get uh, records uh, which, which uh, do not provide values for these fields. Um, you violate certain business rules. Uh, again, restarting will not help. And the last um, example for uh, non-transient errors are uh, maybe a streaming application that you build, a custom application that processes records, which throws a null pointer exception for certain uh, records, not all of them, but for certain records, you maybe um, it, it will, um, I don't know, move into a certain branch of the code and then uh, throw a, a null pointer exception. Again, you cannot automatically recover from that error. You cannot restart the application. It will, again, uh, enter that branch and, and uh, yeah, run into the same issue. Okay, how can we handle these errors? So we have mainly transient um, errors which you can more or less automatically recover from non-transient errors, which you somehow need to, I guess, manually handle. Everyone still awake or? Okay, cool. Um, you all love errors, right? And handling them, cool. Handling transient errors. Um, as kind of teasered, it's uh, the case that they often resolve themselves over time. So if you know IT crowd, um, there I think uh, yeah, somehow first suggestion to, to a user facing a bug is just restarting the system and this might help here. So we have the network and hardware failures and what you can do here is employ retry uh, techniques to resume processing once for instance a Kafka uh, broker or a connection to a Kafka cluster is healthy again. Um, there are ways to uh, even implement this in the um, Kafka consumer producer API, um, but certainly um, yeah, employ some kind of more or less intelligent retry mechanism, uh, try multiple times using fixed or even better incremental back off uh, intervals. Uh, the latter, I think, is not available in the Kafka API, but you can achieve it by, for instance, um, yeah, using an orchestration system like Kubernetes. Um, for software failures, like maybe uh, applications exceeding um, available resources or defined resource limits, um, you should make use of a modern orchestration system like Kubernetes or something uh, similar, uh, which you can use uh, to, to take care of these situations. So Kubelet, if you define resource limits, can take care of restarting applications once they exceed these limits always define them, so I think that's the best practice in the context of Kubernetes. Um, otherwise, you'll, uh, or Kubelet will use some defaults. And uh, also, uh, a good idea is to provide endpoints for like readiness, uh, readiness uh, liveness probes, uh, and so on. Um, how to do that in the context of Kafka streams, uh, we'll also see in a bit. So transient errors you mainly handle by employing retry um, approaches. Um, and just as a hint, if you're using Kafka streams, it comes with, um, uh, by default, uh, not retrying um, yeah, failed broker requests. So just make sure to set the configuration option retries to something larger than zero and also to provide um, a, a reasonable value for retry back off MS, um, or even better, um, expose the, let's say, health status of your Kafka Streams application uh, in a health endpoint, and you, knew, you need to uh, kind of uh, build a custom health endpoint uh, here, and then let your orchestration system uh, handle uh, the retries. We had a look at transient errors. Let's move on to non-transient errors. So in most cases, uh, non-transient errors do not necessarily mean that the entire system is down, but that maybe some records cannot be processed because some files in your S3 record are not in the expected format. Um, 
Also, a huge difference compared to transient arrows is that non-transient arrows you can mostly not automatically take care of, but they require some manual interception um, by you. And the typical solution is to store these faulty records that cannot be processed somewhere else and then let the user decide how to handle them. So it's always a good idea to shift these things over to users. But now we come to like not, a techno um, not, a, not an issue of uh, a matter of technology, but more like an organizational um, matter. Uh, you should really uh, define clear ownership here, like assign a person that uh, needs to take care of, of handling these uh, records that cannot be processed and uh, define clear responsibilities. And let's have a look again at the Kafka source connector, which consumes data from an S3 bucket, um, extracts JSON files, and produces the data to a Kafka topic. Um, if everything goes well, uh, no one complains, uh, we'll have data in the Kafka topic. But what happens if, for instance, an Avro file arrives? So how can we deal with records where the processing fails and Kafka Connect or the connector will throw some kind of exception? So there are different uh, solutions available here. So by default, in the case of Kafka Connect, the processing will fail, the connector will stop, will stop the world, and uh, yeah, processing will no longer work or a streaming data pipeline will hold. That's not optimal. It's a good default, but certainly not optimal. Um, another solution might be configuring Kafka Connect such that it just skips faulty records and continues with processing those records where, well, uh, no exception is being thrown, where processing works. And the third option is, well, sending these faulty records to separate so-called dead letter queue topic and um, storing them there for, let's say, a manual interception or manual investigation and uh, continuing uh, with the processing of the healthy records. Anyone using already that letter queue topics here? Yeah? Cool. A few of you. So you don't need a crash course. <laughs> All right. Um, well, so um, also visual, uh, visualizing that. So whenever there's a record that we cannot process, we could send the record to a dedicated, separate dead data queue topic, and uh, then need to somehow take care of these records. Employing dead data queues with Kafka uh, Connect is quite straightforward. So when you um, pass your connector configuration to Kafka Connect, that's done via calling uh, its API. You just need to provide two extra configuration options. That's like not an example that will work like that. I just wanted to highlight uh, the options that you need for using that letter queues with Kafka Connect. So first option is uh, so-called uh, arrows tolerance, which uh, kind of disables that the connector will stop once it, dis uh, it, it runs into an error. If you only use that configuration option, uh, you'll actually skip uh, the, the faulty records. But if you also provide the arrows dead letter queue topic name configuration option and point it to some uh, topic, Kafka Connect will take care of sending those records where processing failed uh, to this dedicated topic. And then you can um, first monitor that topic for data being produced to it and second, manually uh, take care of the data that could not be processed. And optionally, um, if you don't want to keep your faulty records inside Kafka, of course, you can use, for instance, a separate uh, Kafka Connect connector to send the data to uh, an external system like S3, which might be cheaper to store data. I don't know. Um, for Kafka Streams, we need to manually take care of setting up this logic of sending faulty records to a dead letter queue topic. Um, so what Kafka Streams offers, you can provide handlers for different kinds of exceptions. For instance, 
um, exceptions occurring when deserializing data or when producing data to, to uh, Kafka. Uh, and then you would write a custom exception handler, in this case for deserialization uh, errors, and inside that exception handler, you would take care of sending the failed records to your dead letter queue topic, and that's like a minimal example. So all you need to do is write a custom exception handler, uh, which defines the method handle, which in the case of an error gets uh, some context of the processing, gets the record where the processing has failed, and also gets um, access to the exception that has been thrown. And then inside that method, you can basically tag the record and um, turn it into, into a producer record and send it to the dead letter queue topic. And then you can also decide whether you want to stop the processing or continue. In this case, we're always continuing the processing. Okay, uh, once we have the data in the data letter queue, we should not forget about them, but also consume and process the data um, and uh, decide whether we maybe want to reprocess the data or abandon failed records. So make sure to monitor the data letter queue um, using metrics like maybe the producer rate and then send alerts to your team once new data arrives in the data letter queue topic and take care of the errors. Um, often cases, manual investigation is needed. Uh, maybe bug fixing is needed, so either fix bugs in the data by reprocessing them or fix bugs in your um, application. And uh, well, in the case of the Afro files, um, that are stored in the S3 buckets where we expect JSON, you could, for instance, uh, convert the Afro files to JSON um, using like a minimalistic uh, streaming application or maybe even a Kafka Connect connector and then reroute the data to the, uh, let's say, actual topic. Okay, we had a look at handling transient errors where we mainly employ more or less sophisticated retry mechanisms, handling non-transient errors where we, um, yeah, emphasize the usage of dead letter queues how can we further monitor the health of our streaming data pipelines? Well, there are different components which we also need to separately uh, monitor. Um, let's first have a look at, the, at monitoring the health of Kafka Connect. So um, a Kafka Connect cluster runs typically multiple connectors, um, potentially in uh, the same JVM process, which is, by the way, not always great. And uh, it offers uh, an API that you can call for not only creating, updating, deleting, managing connectors, but also for retrieving the health status of single connectors in that cluster. So what you could do is periodically call the status or health endpoint that Kafka Connect provides and get the health of your connector. Uh, investigate the response. In the case of a healthy connector, you get something like that. The connector is in the state running. In the case of an unhealthy connector, you get access uh, to, well, you see that the state is not failed and get uh, access to the exception that has been thrown um, and kind of the reason why the connector has failed. And well, what you could do here is periodically call these endpoints, investigate the response, and for instance, in case of a failed connector, uh, try restarting the connector maybe a certain um, number of times and then escalate um, to your team. So in some cases, this will fix, for instance, issues like maybe a source connector consuming data from a database that goes down from 2 a.m. to 2 or 5 a.m. So you don't want to stop your connector uh, until the next morning, but resume processing once the database is healthy again. Um, and by the way, Kafka Connect, as well as most or all of the other technologies from the Kafka ecosystem, uh, exposes uh, JMAX metrics, which are great, which you can integrate uh, into your observability tool and then also monitor. Okay, monitoring the health of Kafka Streams applications. Uh, well, you can actually extend your Kafka Streams application, which is 
just a regular Java application with a custom health endpoint, which returns the state of the Kafka Streams application. And on top of that, Kafka Streams also exposes JMAX metrics. OK, this is like a minimal example for um, adding a health endpoint to your Kafka Streams application, which you then can also provide to Kubernetes, for instance. And uh, what Kafka Streams does here is, in memory, it maintains the state of the application. Um, if it's in a running or rebalancing state, it's considered healthy. And we can use that state to, well, uh, return uh, um, in that endpoint the, the health status of the Kafka Streams application. And then query that endpoint with, for instance, uh, yeah, uh, Kubernetes in, in Kubernetes or something else. Um, another thing is monitoring back pressure in streaming data pipelines. So that's also something important and something that's not always obvious when it comes to also investigating the performance um, of the pipeline. So the pipeline might more or less work, but not as uh, expected. So what is uh, back pressure and what are consumer legs? Well, in Kafka, we have Kafka topics, we have consumers. Um, we know offsets of records inside the Kafka topic, which is more or less, let's say, um, a sequential uh, index for the records. Um, we know the offset of the last record that has been consumed by the consumer and the difference between the latest offset available in the Kafka topic and the latest offset that has been consumed by the consumer is the so-called consumer lag, which is zero if there's no data that has not yet been consumed uh, in, the, in the topic and is larger than zero if there's data in the topic which um, yet needs to be uh, consumed. Yeah. And it kind of resembles how much consumers, therefore also applications like Kafka Streams or Kafka Connect, sync connectors, um, are behind in terms of processing. We have two locations on that, let's say, uh, in, in the streaming data pipeline. Um, to consumers in the streaming data pipeline. So we have Kafka Streams applications consuming data from a Kafka topic and Kafka Connect sync connectors consuming the process data from a Kafka topic and then sending it somewhere else. So we have two positions or locations where um, we need to monitor consumer lags. So the first location, we just call it Kafka Streams consumer lag. Um, basically it tells you the number of records that have been extracted by your source connector, for instance, from a database system, but have not yet been processed by the Kafka Streams app. And you should be alerted if that consumer lag goes up over time and never um, yeah, comes down again. So it's uh, natural to, to see fluctuations, um, but if it's never going down again, you're running into problems. and you're seeing back pressure and your, let's say, source connector in this case is producing data at a higher rate than your Kafka Streams application can process. Uh, reasons might be slow data processing. Maybe your Kafka Streams application is calling an external API for, for each record and the API request uh, takes like, I don't know, five seconds while your source connector produces um, 10 events per second. And you can handle that situation, for instance, by increasing the degree of parallelism of your Kafka Streams application or, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, tuning or improving the performance of your code. Second location um, is at the sync connector. And here, the consumer lag more or less means or resembles the number of records that have been produced by your Kafka Streams application to that Kafka topic that is uh, being uh, consumed by the sync connector. And that's like the difference between those records and the records which have been processed by the sync connector and published to an external data sync. Um, again, it means your data sync is slower than your data processing, so maybe you're producing um, data to an external API. Uh, so for instance, in uh, the default configuration producing data to Elasticsearch can, let's say, not be, or is not the fastest uh, thing. So what you can do here again is 
uh, increasing the degree of parallelism, which helps also in the context of Elasticsearch, or maybe uh, sending records and batches to your external system. This will certainly speed up, in some cases, the sync connector. All right, to quickly sum it up and then leave some time for questions in case there are any. Um, just some high level takeaways. So I think it's important to um, differentiate between transient and non transient errors. Um, big takeaway is um, employ retry strategies and always define them, at least some, some basic ones for taking care of transient errors. Handle non transient errors in the context of streaming data pipelines, mainly with dead letter queues. And uh, please not forget uh, to define clear ownership and responsibilities because uh, just writing faulty records to a data light IQ is not enough. You also need to take care of them. Um, using a modern orchestration system to deploy your streaming data pipelines is certainly uh, helpful. And uh, also monitor some, let's say, soft uh, errors uh, like uh, the consumer lags to detect uh, back pressure and performance issues in your streaming data pipelines as early as possible. And uh, that's it from my side. We have uh, 10 minutes left. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for attending. <laughs> and Thank you there. very much, Stefan. Very interesting talk. So we definitely have plenty of time for for questions, who wants to start? Are you asleep or okay? Not tired? Okay, cool. Any? Uh, are there any particular strategies you would use when you hard depend on the order of the uh, messages in some processing uh, partition or topic? You mean for, in the case of non-transient errors, where you send them to a dead letter queue and... Uh, yeah, I mean, dead letter queue is probably not a good option. I can give an example. So like in a banking uh, yeah. world, there is like a typical fraud pattern when you send a small transaction and then you send a large transaction after. So if you fail to process the first one, you might like mistakenly assert that the second one is like, okay, right? Because the risk looks lower. Uh, yeah, I, I think then using a dead letter queue might not be the optimal approach. Um, you could maybe think of kind of finding ways for automatically fixing that issue or stopping everything. It, it also comes down like if you um, handle, for instance, uh, CDC events and maybe one event depends on the other, like maybe an, uh, an update coming after the, like the insert event, and uh, the insert event is being sent to the dead letter queue, but the update event can be successfully um, processed, uh, you might also have issues if you use a dead letter queue. Cool. Any more questions? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Can you add uh, some comments on the batch uh, processing so that um, the consuming and uh, all parsing is all in batches? Then if error happens... You mean like traditional batch processing where you maybe at, I don't know, 8 a.m. process your entire database system or...? Uh, during, during the streaming processing. So let's say the consuming part is uh, in batches. So if 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 one uh, let's say one message is uh, generate uh, errors, systematic error like NPEs. Yeah, I, I think it would still boil down to the same approach because I mean yeah you, you certainly uh, employ batching a lot in streaming systems uh, for performance reasons, but uh, the the let's say processing of the events uh, typically happens event by event unless you have like. Um, stateful operators where you um, need to process windows uh, of events. Not sure whether your question is asking, uh, like, typically event by event, yeah. Also, like, when, you, when we talk about, for instance, uh, deserializing, uh, errors happening when deserializing our, um, our records, uh, I mean, you deserialize records by record, or record by record, not, like, badges, yeah.
Sorry, yeah. Essentially, yeah. I'm talking about like poison, poisonous uh, event, so it's like, like bad event. Yeah. yeah. Cool. There's oh. one more. Coming to you. Thank you. So it was a good presentation. Um, this is one is regarding when you mentioned in the beginning that these streaming services often are involved in very loosely connected applications. Mm -hmm. um, do you have experience and suggestions for situations where it's either very difficult or not possible at all to get all of the log information that you need from one service connected to the whole pipeline? Does that make sense? Like the failure happens without any kind of log, without anything that even appears in a dead letter queue. Does that question make sense? C can you give an example for such an error? Like this, this could be something that is generally could be solved, but I'm wondering about like sticky situations like with Spark, for example. Spark is notorious for having lots of hidden logs where you something fails, but nothing even shows up in the dead letter queue. Nothing, it looks like it even broke, but nothing's working. So um, I guess just wanted to get your thoughts yeah. on handling those kinds of things when it's tricky to actually get all of the data into the Kafka topic. Yeah, uh, so, so first, it's certainly tricky. Um, uh, second, I mean, we didn't discuss, for instance, um, monitoring the logs of the different uh, systems. I think that's like another uh, thing that you need to take care of when operating, for instance, Kafka Connect or Apache Kafka or your streaming uh, applications. Um, monitoring uh, logs is certainly also uh, important. I'm not sure whether these are errors that would be um, kind of could be detected by, by lock monitoring or? Right, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm just yeah. was kind of wondering if you have any known use cases of where like this, um, just basically where Kafka and all of these technologies just can't fully cover it with the, the log stream and the, the, uh, the dead letter queue and all that basically. Like are, mm -hmm. there, are there corner cases that you can think of that are tricky? Uh, Maybe not necessarily. Good question. I, I, <laughs> it, it, I think it also depends a bit on like how you um, uh, configure your Kafka producer and consumer, how reliable uh, it is, the setup. Mm. Um, but I think you can make it quite reliable. And then you should also uh, see, hopefully, most of the errors. OK, great. Um, but we certainly didn't touch uh, logs or log monitoring and so on. Yeah. Well, uh, I guess then we can thank Stefan one more time. Thanks a lot. Thanks.